Hey, what's up guys? Alan Bishop, the One Piece at a Time Distilling Institute, the place where I give you the best possible answers I can given um, the limited capabilities of a lifetime in distilling. So Harold Lloyd asked a great question in the YouTube comments of uh, one of our recent videos, which is when making malt, he has been told that you need to remove the roots. So we're going to get into that. I've been drinking a little bit, and uh, let me just throw this out there because I'm going to release this video in the next, uh, let's say, week or two here. If you are a fan of craft spirits, go out and pick you up a bottle of the new American Mash and Grain uh, craft whiskey blend called Borrowed Page. So this right here has got some of my Lee W. Sinclair uh, four-year-old bourbon whiskey in it um, as a component alongside Wiggle Whiskey, Del Bach, um, Westward Whiskey, and of course ourselves Spirits of French Lick. And let me tell you what, those guys at American Mash and Grain, they did a great job, a fantastic job of blending this whiskey. Um, I was not crazy familiar with those other three distilleries, uh, but I'm going to get crazy familiar with them because I can tell you that as a distiller, I'm incredibly proud of how well my Lee W. Sinclair, uh, just like a child, right, played with those other three whiskeys that are in this blend. Uh, it is fantastic. Look it up on Google. You'll find it. Uh, American Ration Grain, Borrowed Page, beautiful label. Uh, for those who don't know or may not have noticed, i got to find it here because the camera's backwards, sorry. Where did it go? That sure looks an awful lot like my still Inanna right there, complete with uh, the wires, the temperature gauge, and all that stuff. Anyways, on the topic of malt. Well, before we get there, let's go here. Uh, if you have any questions, reach out to me, bishopshomegrown at gmail.com. Uh, we also have a new Proton Mail email that I have not memorized yet. I believe it's one piece at a time, enterprises at Proton Mail, whatever it is, dot net, dot com, whatever. Uh, next video, I will have that information prepared for everyone. Uh, or in any of my social media, or in YouTube comments. We also have some Patreon stuff coming up. We're working on a cool, very unique, exclusive still design with uh, Jason Wade Harrell uh, from 13 Stills. Something for you guys specifically on this channel that we can all play with and learn from together. So on to the malt question. So do you need to knock the roots off of the malt? So, it depends on what malt you're making and what you're trying to do with it. So generally the answer, probably 90 to 95% of the time is ideally yes. If you're making corn malt, you're gonna wanna knock those roots off. If you're making oat malt, you're gonna not wanna knock those roots off. If you're making barley malt, you're gonna wanna knock those roots off. If you're, you know, just in general, all those grains. There are exceptions, however. And bear this in mind, if you're dealing with just raw malt, I would always knock them off. If you're dealing with smoked malt and you want some earthy, grassy characteristics because you're gonna age it for a while, I'd leave those roots in place. The big exception would be very odd things that are very rarely malted. Um, and you guys are gonna have access to a kit that includes one of these things. Uh, that particular thing would be malted sunflower malted roasted black oil seed sunflower the reason for that is the actual seed of the sunflower is pretty small and by the time that it sprouts it's used up about 50 percent of that seed so if you want to include any of that flavor in your mash you are going to keep those roots on particularly if you roast it and or you smoke it i think the same can be true for certain corn varieties, especially if they're going to age, listen, that, that root is surface area. While there is some grassiness, some earthiness, uh, some more robust, savory flavors in that root as opposed to without having roots, if you're going to go into a barrel or you're going to put some wood in a jar or whatever you're going to do, you want something that can hold up over time, right? Uh, and the way you do that, now now bear in mind, specifically here we're talking about sugar shines. Again, we're not talking about all grains necessarily. We're talking about sugar shines where you're not using a ton of that malt. You're using maybe one pound per every 10 gallons of wash that you make. I would leave that root intact because there's a lot of flavorful expression that can come through. It may not be great or interesting in particular in a white spirit, but if it's going to go on wood, it's 
probably worth thinking about keeping to give an extra dimensionality to that particular spirit. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's all about uh, learning what you like and making what you like and figuring out what the best, best method and process for making what you like is. Other examples would be things like quinoa or amaranthus. Those are very, 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 very small, tiny even, pseudo grains, right? And if you want any surface area, you want any uh, real power whatsoever in that finished whiskey, if you malt those, you're probably going to want to hold on to uh, those roots that grow off of them, particularly, again, if they're smoked or roasted or something of that nature. Um, this would be entirely different if you were making an all grain, but we're just going to stick to sugar shine for this one video. So there is a positive and a negative to all of those things, right? Um, we've talked about this before in the past with positive and negative flavor con contributions. You know, anything can go positive or negative. It's all about what you like, what you think you want. And then there's a predictability or being able to try to predict what you might like in the future, which is a little bit risky, but let's be honest. You're probably, the majority of you watching this are home distillers, so you're not exactly risk averse to begin with and you're willing to spend some money on your hobby and if you're willing to spend some money on your hobby you're probably willing to do a at least 10 gallon mash run some whiskey off of it or some spirit off of it regardless and see what it does so what i would say here is experiment but understand that while there are some hard and fast rules of distillation there's also a lot of stuff that's not off limits just because other people say it's off limits or because you've read that it's off limits or because some jackass in Southern Indiana and Washington County and Pekin, Indiana says that you shouldn't do it. Doesn't mean that it may not be worth trying one way or the other. Um, and I will tell you, for example, again, with the malted roasted sunflower malt that I make to use here, I don't knock the roots off of it. I never knock the roots off of it. Nine times out of ten, if I'm making corn malt to go into a sugar shine, I'm only going to add, you know, again, one one pound per every ten gallons. Uh, basically, ten percent of a sugar shine, a sugar shine being, you know, uh, one pound grain, uh, one pound sugar, one gallon of water. Most of the time, I don't knock the roots off of my corn malt because, again, a lot of times it's being smoked, or even if it's not being smoked, I kind of like that earthy, grassy complexity that comes through. There's something interesting, fun, and very different from what everyone else is making out there um, that you can get off of that if you experiment. You figure out your proportions, you figure out the way you need to distill, the cuts you need to make, whether or not you're aging it, you're not aging it, etc. There's so much variability, right? Um, I've had some very strange spirits in my life that... On the face of it, when somebody told me what it was, my immediate reaction was, I don't know why you would do that, and I doubt that's very good, and then I get proven wrong. So always bear that in mind. Um, so this one's kind of 50-50. There's a risk there, but it might be a risk worth the reward, depending on what you're doing. And I think that a lot of distillation is actually that way. Um, and you'll find historical precedents for all these things out there, right? It's just that... Uh, They've never been talked about in the public domain because they tend to be played a little closer to the heart by distillers in the know. And on top of that, there's not a whole lot of distillers really in the know because very few of them have really practiced these, uh, these arts to that depth. And you don't know what you don't know, guys. All right, reach out to me. I love y'all. Sign up for our Patreon. It's coming up soon. Uh, buy a uh, mash kit. There's a limited uh, amount of those. Three different versions of it out there um, from our store, which we will link to shortly. And uh, I will also say that if you would really like to support us, you like the content that we're creating, you like the stuff we're putting out there, uh, go to our link tree, which I will have a link to in the comments on YouTube, and uh, uh, leave us a quote-unquote tip. I believe that's the link uh, at the very top of our link tree. Uh, it helps inspire us, helps keep us going, helps us keep buying materials, helps us keep researching helps us keep pushing the boundaries of distillation in general, y'all. All right. I love you. Have a good one. I'll catch you later.